produces the same Nash equilibrium even, even though we looked at the simplification. You should, before you play it, you should go into a closed room and bring a coin. On each side of this coin, you put 1F and 2F. And then you start flipping. You write down all these flips that will give you a very long stream of how to play it. And then you have to put this into your head. So then you can go out playing it, okay? And then that would be the way to play it. Of course, given that those you play against also understand game theory, which is could be sometimes uh, hard to know, of course. But if they are reasonably rational and intelligent people, and who would play against fools? That's not much interesting, is it anyway? So now you know how to play this game. Of course, at the same time, you know how to play a rock, paper, scissors, then socks and papier, which should be played this in the same manner. Of course, you have to adjust the probabilities then, because there are three outcomes. So it would be a third on probability for each of them. OK. Now we kind of approached finding this Nash equilibrium by a kind of stepwise technique. And it's, of course, not perfectly good here, because we just looked at certain points for Q and certain points for P. We al also only did half of the job. We kind of just conjecture that the other part of the best five must kind of be the opposite of the first one. If you're interested in looking in how to do this, there is an appendix A in this textbook, which kind of devises a mathematical method on how to find this mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. But we will you will not be tested in doing this on the exam. Okay? But on the other hand, you kind of need to be able to identify them. So if you get a game where it is not both a circle and a square in the same subsquare, then you your answer should be this game has no Nash equilibrium in pure strategies. That's what we call it. Okay? So either a game has Nash equilibria in pure strategies, like some of the first games we looked at, like this Prisoner's Dilemma game, for instance, or they can have Nash equilibria in mixed strategies, like this game. There are games who have both, okay, both pure strategy as well as mixed strategy. But if you look at two by two games, normally if there is a singular pure Nash equilibrium, then there is not also a mixed strategy equilibrium. On the other hand, if there are two pure strategy Nash equilibria, then typically there is also a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. So it seems to some extent that this Nash equilibria kind of pops up in odd numbers, 1, 3, 5, and so on, OK? You kind of, in certain situations, if there are two, you get another one in mixed strategies. Uh, have anybody of you heard about a game called Chicken? Yeah. Can you tell us what kind of game that is, or do you feel it hard to express yourself in English? Or do you want to do it in Norwegian? Chickens out. Yeah. yeah, not being the chicken. You know, chicken means being cowardish in English, OK? It was kind of introduced in a very old movie, I think, with James Dean and Natalie Wood called uh, Ruthless Youth. Ruthless Unum in Norwegian, where they kind of drive uh, two cars driving towards a cliff. No, not a cliff. Uh, the opposite of a cliff. Uh, what do you call that? Stoop? Uh, yeah, some kind of ravine or something. Okay, and then the idea is to drive towards that one, and the guy who kind of jumps out of the car lost wins. Alternatively, we can drive against each other. That's also an option. That's an alternative version of chicken. These chicken games, they have two pure Nash equilibria. Either one pops up first or the other, but you really don't know who does it. Okay, and That also has a kind of Nash equilibrium like this added to it. So we, we have a kind of special type of games, which we call chicken games. The opposite of a chicken game is called a stag hunt game. In a stag hunt game, you end up oppositely as to the chicken game. So you get what we refer to as a coordinated equilibrium, meaning that the agents cannot do the same thing. So in a chicken situation, one do does 
chooses one strategy, the other chooses the other, being the first to jump out. Okay, obviously that will have to happen. But in the Stagion game, they kind of coordinate, so they do the same. Typically, it could be kind of choice of technology, for instance. Um, say that there are two firms competing on some new technology, either te technology of type A or technology of type B. And then the game theory prediction would be that either they both choose technology A or they both choose technology B. Okay, They do not separate. And the reason, of course, is that the structure of these games kind of makes it, in a sense, risky to separate because then if the other one is successful, you cannot kind of catch him. So you kind of reduce this risk by mimicking your competitor. And also those kind of games have an added uh, Nash equilibrium in mixed strategies. Of course, the best replies look different in those cases. They typically would look something like this. It's the same structure. It goes like this, but it kind of overlaps more like this. So you get a pure strategy Nash equilibrium here, a pure strategy Nash equilibrium here, and a mixed one here. Alternatively, they may look something like this. Yeah, uh, 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 like this. So then you get the triplet again, but it kind of goes upwards as downwards here. And this is the chicken, I think, and this is the stagnant, or vice versa. But it doesn't really matter. We, 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 will, we won't kind of dig into these games any further in these course, but they are kind of classical games which uh, it may be sensible to know a little bit about. What, what's typical for them is that there are an odd number of Nash equilibria, two pure strategy and one mixed strategy. What Nash actually proved then was that there will always be a crossing here. No matter how these games are formulated, whether there are two players, or 100 players, millions of strategies, whatever. He was able to prove that. So there will always be a kind of cross like this, and that was his major contribution here. That tells us that if we deal with these type of games, we can always be guaranteed a solution. And that's nice to know. Okay? Not like a second degree equation, which doesn't always have a solution, does it? If it looks like this, then there is no crossing here. So then you don't find a solution. Then you have to use these complex numbers. This is probably some of you maybe have learned about, or maybe not. No. Okay. I'm uh, talking rubbish now. Let's forget that. Okay. Then we have learned what we need in game theory. Okay. We've learned about sequential games, kind of looking at game trees, rolling back, forward from the back. We have learned about these matrix games or simultaneous games, how to find best replies, how to find Nash equilibria. Finally, we looked at this mixed strategy parts, which is something we at some points need to look at. There's a lot in game theory we haven't learned, of course. But if you're really interested, you need to find another course or uh, read it yourself. Unfortunately, many game theory books are hard to understand, so it's important to look at the correct books. But I assume you are kind of satisfied with this for the moment. So Then if you want to grasp uh, heavier into this, you can do it at a later point in time. So now we move into this book. Let's see what, where should we start? Yeah, we will start by a question. Why is football so popular? Start by spending a little bit of time discussing this question. Um, I assume, you, to some extent, you have a feeling that football is the most popular of all sports. I don't know whether you, how clear you kind of see that. So we'll spend a little time on discussing some 
facts about this and try to argue why it is so popular and why it is more popular that than other comparable sports. That's the idea. Uh, Uh, there is some classical arguments here, okay? Let's start by them, okay? The first argument which is often given is that it's cheap. It's cheap to play football. What does that mean? Yeah, it means that <coughs> it means that a single person can enjoy playing football. It means that several persons can enjoy playing football. They really don't need perhaps a good ball. They don't need a good pitch. They can play it on the streets, on some grass somewhere around. So this cheapness is something which is typical for football if you compare it to other stuff. Like for instance, downhill skiing. Of course, if you prepare, if you want to do downhill skiing, then you need a lot of stuff, don't you? You need some downhill skis, you need some downhill shoes, you need some downhill sticks, you need a helmet, you need a driving suit, but most of all, you need a kind of hill, don't you? And if there is not an elevator in that hill, then you won't do much downhill skiing, do you? Because in that case, you'll have to take your skis on your back and walk up on the top, drive down, and do it again. Of course, th the, the first time you do this, you don't, don't want to repeat it, because it's... You won't be able to do more than 1% uh, downhill skiing and 99% walking. So that's more like uh, walking exercises, isn't it? If you want to do speed skating, of course you need, spits, you need skates, but you also need ice. Because in the winter time it may be ice, or it may not be ice, and if there's not ice in the winter time, then you need artificial ice. Artificial ice costs money. So that's one point, obviously, that football is a kind of sport which you can do anywhere, everywhere, alone or with people or whatever. It's, it's kind of flexible related to how to do it. Okay, it doesn't focus too much on equipment. Of course, you need a ball of some sense, but you've probably all seen these movies from Brazil where people, or Africa, where people play with uh, rubbers or whatever. Okay, it, it doesn't seem to matter that much. So there is a certain cheapness with football. <coughs> and now I write contribution. A very fascinating thing about football is that you really don't have to be very good to make a difference. To you. Of course, as you, you, you see me, I'm obviously a very bad football player. But of course, I may stand at the corner posts on a corner from the opposite team and at some point I may save a goal. Okay, so I may do I may perform a very valuable contribution, even though I'm not necessarily very good at it. Okay. If you compare these to other types of sports, you will see that most other types of sports, you need some kind of skill, you need some kind of competence. If you want to do ice hockey, for instance, if you can't skate, then... Of course, if nobody can skate, then it, uh, it doesn't matter. But if, if there's somebody who can skate and somebody who can't skate, then this match doesn't work as opposed to the football case, where it still can work, even if I'm not a good football player. Of course, this holds for most other competing sports. We talked about ice hockey. What about ski jumping? Of course, that's extremely dangerous if you don't have the skill. And most people wouldn't dare, unless they have kind of started very early in very small hills, trying the 30 meters, then moving upwards and so on, okay? Um, biathlon, of course, you need to be able to shoot. Okay, if, if, you, if you don't know how to handle a gun, you're not allowed to do it sorry, because it's dangerous. Okay, you, you walk around with a gun on your back, and uh, lots of crazy things can happen. Obviously, so you need a certain skill level there. Okay, handball, 
if you don't really know the rules in handball, it doesn't make any sense, does it? If you start running more than three steps, okay. So y again, you need some skill to make it work. And of course, if you want to play basketball, if you're very small, of course, there are certain, uh, very few small players who make it, but mostly they are very tall, okay. So that's kind of more like a te technological problem. You need to have certain abilities to be able to play it. And football is nicely free of this stuff, okay? You have small football players, you have big football players, you have slow football players, you have lo fast football players, you have all kind of football players. So it's kind of rich in its strategic space, kind of allowing people with a lot of different abilities to actually be part of it. Tennis, like uh, Jenka plays, needs an extreme skill, doesn't it? Have you if, you, if you if you can't serve, then of course you can't play tennis, can you? It doesn't make any sense. You have to be able to pass the ball over the net into the right corner before the match starts. If you don't, if if one of the players is not able to do that, there is no play, is it? So this is a very fascinating part about football. Okay, it opens up for some kind of skill freeness. Okay, you don't need these abilities. You can still do it. And it has this nice feature that those who are very good can actually do it at the same time as those who are not very good, and both parties can still enjoy it. And this is a very nice feature, because it opens up for a great big interest. Okay. There is numerous stories about bad football players who have a lot have had stories about the big goal they got. Okay, of course they may probably bad, but they didn't don't see it in their own head as bad. Okay, because they made that goal. But that the point is that you can do that in football. You can perhaps not do it in handball, or in volleyball, or in basketball, or in baseball. Maybe in American football. Maybe that's a kind of sport which resembles football to some extent, even though they have kind of killed it by these crazy rules. I, I perhaps rugby is something that it kind of is closer to this ability of football. You know the difference between American football and rugby? Yeah. You do that, don't you? Yeah. So should I ask one of you to come up here and explain the difference between rugby and American football? No, I won't do that. Take it easy. So it's cheap and it's kind of skill-free. So it kind of opens up for everybody to take part in it. Okay, that, that's kind of the idea by this classical way of arguing why football is more popular than handball, for instance. Okay. You're aware of that, aren't you? You have seen these handball stadiums, they take at most 20,000 spectators, but the football stadiums, they take up to 100. So it's kind of visible that there is a, a major difference in interest for these sports. Okay, let's have a little look on some numbers that may, uh, let's see here. Maybe we should turn on the projector. What? I'm not logged on here. Who is this? Segarak Boyjan. Do you know this guy? You must be careful. Always log out of the computer, okay? Now I have access to these guys, everything. Is, is it any of you? No. What is the thing I should do now? What is your suggestion? Should I sneak or should I log out? Perhaps log out, okay? That seems like a, uh, the politically correct solution, okay? So let me log off here. Oh, be careful with this because there's not an automatic log on it. So if you're into a computer, always get out of it. Because if there is something there that you don't want everybody to see, then follow my rule here. Now let's see if you can find my user here. Then, then it will be better. Do you think I should update this? No. Mm -mm. 
where is my network disks? There they are. You see I have a lot of documents. No. It's not here. No, it doesn't seem that I put that on in. Ah. And I have to go somewhere else. Maybe here. Yeah, I'm just looking for something here. what I liked very much, to be honest. Maybe I should try to find some other copy somewhere. Mm, yeah, I might have an alternative down in my pocket. I just want to take off the textbook, but it didn't seem to didn't seem to work very nicely on these computers. So let me here instead. That seems better, okay, more recent copy. Okay, here you see some numbers uh, describing the popularity of football. Uh, what is done in this table is to kind of register the number of TV viewers on three different events the World Cup in uh, football in the United States in 94 and the World Cup in football in France in 98 and compare it to the Olympics in between the Atlanta in 96 and if you look at the number of viewers here you see that uh, there was 32.1 32 billion viewers on the United States Soccer World or Football World Championship and uh, 37 billion on the same event four years later in France. You probably remember, or maybe you don't, Norway was playing in both these two events, reaching the eighth final in 98. Uh, if you compare to the Olympics, the Summer Olympics in Atlanta, it had uh, close to half the amount of TV viewers as these two only football championships. And of course, if you take into account that Olympic sports uh, contains a lot of different sports, doesn't it? There is handball and volleyball and even some kind of football. And there is, um, what else is there? There is uh, athletics, there is shooting, there is arrow, bow and arrow shooting and whatever. There is uh, hundreds and hundreds of sports. And of course, if you kind of take each of these sports and divide uh, these 19.6 on each of them, then you understand that football is a whole different magnitude when it comes to TV viewer popularity. Okay? So these numbers indicate that football is enormously much more popular than other sports. And the question we could ask is whether 
these arguments here is the only reason for that. I doubt that. So, uh, I try to argue a little bit in the textbook on what other reasons could there be that makes football that much more interesting than other sports. Of course, there is um, an exception here, isn't it? There are a certain part in the world where football is not very popular. What kind of place do you think about then, do you think? United States, Christian, you should raise your voice. Very good. So why is football not very popular in the United States? It's being looked upon as a girly version of American football? Yeah, the Americans, they, they, <laughs> they, want to, they want to win when they perform uh, sports, don't they? So instead of losing in football, they invented their own version instead. That seems like a good idea, doesn't it? Uh, you, you can see some notions on that if you look at... Um, the female part of football, which has been very popular in the United States, of course, they have also achieved a lot. They have won a lot of... Uh, oh, yeah, this is just some, some numbers related to the United States uh, audience in the 98 uh, in France. And uh, a fair amount have heard about it, but I seem to recall that the World Championship in Brazil this time kind of lifted the, the interest in the States a little bit, it seemed. There was a lot of reports about Americans gathering in pubs in huge amounts. It was a, a big screen outside the Washington Monument. In, and so I, I saw at least these pictures of Americans gathering to, to see football. But uh, in general, I think that the main reason why the Americans kind of haven't adopted European football is that they have never been very successful in it. Of course, by Norwegian standards, the USA is extremely successful, even in male football, because they normally qualify for most championships. and they regularly progress from the, the group stages. So in general, they end up uh, losing the eighth or the quarterfinals. So in that sense, they compete at a very high level. But of course, the Americans don't, they kind of don't ac acknowledge that as a high level. They kind of believe that uh, we should win, at least sometimes. And we have seen that on the female side, haven't we? That, um, yeah, here you can see some of course, this is an old book. So uh, the, the U.S. female teams, they, they won the Olympics in 96. They were number four in Sydney in 2000. Did Norway win then? Yeah. yeah. And they were number three in Sweden in 95 and number one in, in 99. And they, uh, after this, they have performed not as good, perhaps, but still at a very competitive level, even though the Germans have come and the Brazilians uh, have come up and increase their qualities, still uh, the United States perform well in championships. And if you look at um, some numbers on uh, spectators, at least for the time being when the professional league was kind of functioning in the United States for females, that, uh, they, they had a fairly good uh, viewing uh, counts. So uh, I kind of normally say that uh, the United States, they kind of needed uh, just like Norway needed uh, Roald Amundsen to kind of conquer the South Pole, the Americans needed to construct some sports where they could kind of beat the other guys. And of course they did. They are today they are best in basketball, they are best in baseball. And Although they're not best in ice hockey, they are normally re reasonably good in ice hockey, okay? at least on the women's level and sometimes even on the, the men's level. They have at least a good league there. So uh, in general, when we kind of overlook this exception of the United States, which kind of has historical and cultural reasons, we, we can safely conclude that football, by all means, is the most popular sport in the world. If we kind of believe these Olympic comparison numbers, then we can say it's not even the most popular sport, it's, it's more popular than all the other sports put together to some extent. Okay, and that's, that's kind of heavy. So the question then, is it only these two arguments here that kind of produce this popularity? Or is there something else? And my allegation is that there is something else. Okay. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Let's see. The reason for this very simple conclusion from my point of view is that there is a lot of games who have these abilities which are not very popular. 
Okay. Uh, you know the Norwegian game Ludo, for instance. It's very cheap to play. Everybody can contribute, but it's still not popular, is it? So why is Ludo, or yeah, there's a numerous amount of these games we can look at, isn't it? Why are these games not popular, but football is still popular? What is it with football that has that these games don't have? It has a certain complexity. Okay. Many so-called experts like to kind of downgrade football's complexity, saying that football is kind of a simple game, there are 22 men running around in the field and there is a ball and this kind of stuff. Of course the rules are fairly simple, you're not allowed to kick your opponent, you can kick the ball, you're not allowed to take it with your hand, of course the keeper is allowed to do that. Uh, of course there's kind of a lot of rules here, but in general they are relatively easy. So one thing to mark here is that it's not the complexity of the rules that makes the complexity of the game. Okay, that's two different things. A very simple ruled game can be very complex, and a very complex ruled game can be very simple. Uh, so that is one point to to note. Let's let's have a look at this rock paper scissors game. Okay, let me see if I can find some. Uh, Okay, here is a kind of figure trying to say something about the strategic complexity of rock, paper, scissors. Okay? Uh, in game theory, we talk about something called the strategy space of a game and the strategy combination. A strategy combination is kind of holding one instance of actions from the players. Okay? So in this case, the strategy combination could be that player one chooses rock and player two chooses rock. Okay, that's one something that can happen in a game. But the strategy space is kind of the po possible outcomes of what can happen. Okay, then there is scissors, scissors, paper, scissors, rock, scissors, scissors, paper. So you just run through it. And of course, this part is always bigger than this part. This game is not very popular. It's cheap and you don't need any contribution or skill to take part. Of course there are world championships in rock, paper, scissors, even though they don't have a lot of audience today. There are no sponsors, there are no viewers who want to pay big money to watch it, so the demand for this game is very small. And my point is that the reason for that is that this strategic space here is far too easy, okay? It doesn't contain any complexity, of course, in this case, uh, it's, it's even a silly game, because we all know how to play it. So why, why should you play it then? There is no skill, okay, you, we well have al already kind of argued that the Nash equilibrium is a, is a mixed strategy with a, a third on each, so then why should you play that game at all? Of course, Ludo is slightly more complex, because there are some decisions here. You have to make, ch choose if you get the six, whether to take out a, a, a <laughs> what do you call it? this this thing you, you move around or you, you should kind of use your double throw to move what you have but this one is uh, completely silly so there's another game which is kind of complex chess isn't it you know how to play chess yeah it's a it's a version of tic-tac-toe although it's much more complex okay because there are more pieces, there are more routes to move to, and there are more different possible moves for the players, okay, the peasant can go one or two and so on, okay. But still chess compared to football is nothing, okay, chess is like a, the head of a needle, while football is kind of the whole universe, if you compare the complexity of these two games. And the reason is very simple, because if you think about football, it has many players, okay? There are at least 22. Are there, do you have any more than 22 players in, in football? You don't think so, Christian? Or, yeah. What about the referees? At the same time, you have the players, but you have the referees. The referees, are they players in the football? They are. They make decisions that kind of influence the outcome of the game, which is kind of what 
What about the audience? Are there players in the game? Yeah, at least some football clubs say that, okay? You heard about the 12th man, haven't you? Yeah, so there is a lot of audience around here. Then we are suddenly moving up, okay? So when Real Madrid and Barcelona played on Saturday, it was at least 100,000 players in that game, something around that. Do you have any other players? What about the coach? Yeah, the coach, yeah. What about the medical support? Yeah, they also play a part here, don't they? Owners of the clubs, the sponsors. So there's a lot of players here, okay? At that point, we understand kind of the complexity, at least from that side. There is a big field, okay? All these players, whether on the field or not, they kind of move around there. There is a lot of time, 90 minutes. There is no rule restrictions which defines that a lot of the space is killed. You know, in handball, for instance, it's not allowed to play defensively, is it? What happens if you play defensively in handball? The, whis the referee whistles. And he then he gives the ball to the others. What about football? It's allowed to play defensively in football, isn't it? Yeah. Do you think that is kind of a major difference? Oh, yes, of course. Because all the defensive strategies are there. But in handball, there are only offensive strategies. Okay, so the kind of half of the strategies are kind of already taken out of handball. Of course, handball are played with less players, on a much smaller field, which by itself, of course, takes down the complexity. And you have all these silly rules. Okay, you have to end. Yeah, you know, in basketball, it's the same. You have to end each attack in three seconds, or five seconds. Or what is it? Twenty-five. Twenty-five. Twenty-four. Twenty-four. Do you play basketball? I'm sorry if I, I you, I'm not trying to. It used to be 30 seconds. Yeah. Now, when I kind of compare football with other sports, it doesn't mean that I think they are silly, okay? But I'm, I'm try just to trying to pinpoint the differences here, okay? So it's 24 seconds. You have to. Do you have a defensive play in basketball? Yeah. That's allowed. Yeah. So do we see any basket yeah. teams yeah. playing defensive play? Standing on their own porch, throwing the ball to each other? Why don't we see that? Because you, you, have, you have eight seconds to get to the other side of the court. Okay. So you don't have defensive play in basketball either then? No. 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 So it's kind of, by the rules, it's taken out. What about ice hockey? Do we have defensive play in ice hockey? Is it allowed? It is allowed. Okay. You can stand in your own zone smashing the puck to each other. But we don't see it. Why, don't, why, do, why do you think we don't see it? Ah, correct. It's because it's very dangerous. You know, if you kind of miss the ball, then it suddenly is a goal. Okay? So as opposed to football, we kind of have enough space to make a viable strategy for defensive play. Okay, it's time for a break. <laughs>